the limit as x goes to zero, three tan x minus three cosine squared x tan x over x cubed. Okay, first, I'm going to factor out three tan x. Right, when I do that here, I'm left with one, and here I'm left with co minus cosine squared x. Now, one minus cosine squared x is just sine squared x from the main Pythagorean identity. Now I'm going to go ahead and split this limit up into pieces. First, I'm going to pull the three out in front of the limit. And then I'm going to think of this as tan x over x and sine squared x over x squared, right? And then I'm going to use the rule for limits about products that says I can write this as the limit of tan x over x and the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x all squared. Okay, so I just used various basic limit rules to split this into more manageable pieces. You'll notice that if you multiply all this together, three tan x sine squared x, and on the bottom, x times x squared is x cubed. Okay, now these are pretty basic limits. The limit as x goes to zero of tan x over x is one, and the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x is also one, and one squared is one. Now, if you forgot either of these limits, you could get them pretty easily using L'Hopital's rule, right? For example, limit as x goes to zero, tan x over x, the derivative of the top is secant squared x, derivative of the bottom is one, and the secant squared of zero is just one, right? Because the cosine of zero is one and the reciprocal of one is one. Uh, similarly here, uh, the derivative of sine x is cosine x, the derivative of x is one, and the cosine of zero is just one. Okay, so the answer here is three. Let the function k satisfy limit as h goes to zero, k of seven plus h minus k of seven over h equal to 12. Which of the following must be true? All right, well, first just notice that this expression says k prime of seven is equal to 12, right? This is exactly the definition of the derivative of k evaluated at seven, right? So k prime of seven is 12. In particular, the derivative at seven does exist. k prime of seven exists, it's equal to 12. So the second one is true. Now, since k prime of seven is 12, that means that k is differentiable at seven. We have an answer for the derivative at seven right? And differentiability at 7 implies continuity at 7. So k is also continuous at x equals 7. So the first one is also true. Now for the third one, there's nothing here that indicates that k prime should be continuous at x equals 7, right? All that this says is that k prime is equal to 12. There's nothing here that says that k prime is continuous at x equals 7. Uh, as a challenging problem, you might want to try to come up with a counterexample, a function k, such that uh, k prime of 7 exists, k is continuous, but k prime is not continuous at x equals 7. So the third one is false. The limit as x goes to 11, x over x minus 11 squared. Well, the function x over x minus 11 squared has a vertical asymptote of x equal to 11, right? Because this has the form, I put the equal sign in quotes because it has the form 11 over zero, meaning when you plug the 11 in, you get an 11 in the numerator and 11 minus 11 is zero squared, which is zero in the denominator. Whenever you get something of the form that has a non-zero number up top and zero on the bottom, you're guaranteed a vertical asymptote at that value. Okay, so if x is near 11, because x over x minus 11 squared is always positive, right? If you're near 11, then the top is going to be positive. It's going to be close to 11. And the bottom is going to be some number squared. And anything squared is always positive except a zero. But it's not zero because we're not equal to 11. We're near 11, right? So that's positive. That means that the answer is positive infinity. In general, uh, for these types of limits that have the form a non-zero number over zero, the answer is either plus infinity, minus infinity, or doesn't exist if it goes to one of them from the left and a different one from the right. And 
In practice, you can figure out which of these it is by doing a little sign chart near 11. I put the zero in also as a cutoff point because that's where the function is zero. You would always put in uh, the places where the function is zero or undefined. And then to see what the limit is, we just test points in the intervals defined by these cutoff points that are close to 11. So a little to the left of 11 and a little to the right. And we could go as far back as we want as long as we don't go past zero, right? So for example, if we test a five in here, we get a positive number over something squared is always positive. And if we plug a 12 in, same thing, we get a positive over a positive. So it's positive from both directions. Therefore, the limit is positive infinity. The following function has a removable discontinuity at x equals c. So the function is g of x equals x squared plus 4x minus 12 over x squared plus 3x minus 10. Find c and then define a function capital G such that capital G is continuous at x equals c and capital G of x is equal to little g of x for all x in the domain of little g. All right, so it would help to factor that top expression, right? The, uh, and the bottom, the top factors is x minus two times x plus six, right? x squared plus six x minus two x is four x, negative two times six is negative 12. And similarly, the bottom factors is x minus two times x plus five, right? x times x is x squared. Five x minus two x is positive three x and negative two times five is negative 10, right? So because there's an x minus two on top and an x minus two on the bottom, this function is equal to x plus six over x plus five, as long as x is not equal to two, okay? So if we take the limit as x goes to two g of x, that's just equal to, we could use this version because x is not equal to two, it's approaching two. So two plus six over two plus five, which is uh, eight over seven, okay? So, this shows that g has a removable discontinuity to x equals two, because the limit as x goes to two g of x exists. When the limit exists, but the, um, there's a discontinuity, it's called a removable discontinuity. So c equals two is the answer for the c we were supposed to find, right? Notice that negative five, there's gonna be a non-removable discontinuity, but the question asks for removable discontinuity, so that's at two. Okay, and for the second part, we can now define this function capital G, right, by letting it equal to little g for x not equal to two, and the limiting value that we just found of eight sevenths when x is equal to two. Gasoline is dripping out of a gas pump, filling up a bucket. The amount of gasoline in the bucket at time t for t between zero and four is given by a differentiable function, capital G, where t is measured in minutes. Selected values of g of t measured in pints are given in the table below. Use the data in the table to approximate g prime of 1.5. Show the computations that lead to your answer and indicate units of measure. Okay, so g prime of 1.5, we can approximate it. Right? 1.5 is right between one and two, so we could approximate it using the secant line passing through the points 1, 2.2, and 2, 4.5. So g of 2 minus g of 1 over 2 minus 1, which is, well, g of 2 is 4.5, g of 1 is 2.2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So we get 2.3, and right, so uh, t is measured in minutes, g of t is measured in pints, so it's pints per minute. Let f be the continuous function defined on the closed interval negative five eight, whose graph consisting of three line segments and a semicircle centered at four zero is shown below. Let capital F be the function that is defined by capital F of x equals the integral from two to x little f of t dt. For each of capital F prime of negative four, F double prime of negative four, F prime of six and F double prime of six, find the value or explain why it does not exist. Okay, let's start with f prime of negative four, which by the fundamental theorem of calculus is equal to little f of negative four. Now this is the graph of little f here. So little f of negative four is just two because the point negative four comma two is on the graph. So that's just two. f double prime of negative four is little f prime of negative four, 
right? Which is negative one because the slope of this line here is negative one. Okay. Capital F prime of six is little f of six, again, by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So that is equal to zero because the point uh, six comma zero is on the curve. And capital F double prime of six is little f prime of six, which does not exist because there's a messy looking cusp over here at the point x equals six. That's a point of non-differentiability. Again, let f be the continuous function defined on the closed interval negative 5, 8, whose graph consisting of three line segments and a semicircle centered at 4, 0 is shown below. On what open intervals contained in x between negative 5 and 8 is the graph of capital F both increasing and concave up? Justify your answer. So the graph of f is increasing if and only if capital F prime, which is equal to little f, is greater than zero, right? So little f is greater than zero when it's above the x-axis. Now the graph of capital F is concave up if and only if capital F double prime, which is equal to little f prime, is greater than zero. And that's if and only if little f is increasing. And you could see the two places where it's increasing here, here, and here. So f is above the x-axis and increasing on the following intervals, x between 2 and 4, and x between 6 and 8. 